towards finding answers. If you're just going to be doubtful for the sake of being doubtful, that's not fun. That's just called stupidity. Doubt moves. Doubt moves you towards seeking what is right uh, and correct and, and to help make sense of things. So doubt can be a good thing. So we don't, we don't dis, you know, dismiss doubt at all. But also, too, I think questions help us as far as disciples. That God has given us this hunger. And the hunger manifests itself in the form of questions. If we didn't have questions, there, there would not be this sense of longing and yearning within us to want to know. And oftentimes the deepest questions are the, the, the knowing that involves uh, where did we come from? Where, why are we here? Where are we going? What's my purpose? All those important questions. So I think this is really, really important. Now, for us as disciples in Jesus, answering questions that coincide with the word is critical. So take out your Bibles. We're going we're gonna to talk a little bit this morning. So uh, we may open up the floor this morning to your questions, but we also have a, a set of questions that have already been given to us. And I'm going to just, nothing has been planned uh, as far as like how we're going to discuss these things. This is very organic, very much of the spirit. Um, a, a few of these questions have been shared with some of these guys. So I don't know where they're going to come from. Uh, we may not be in harmony with some of the questions, which is another good example that as the church, there are the, the essentials that we believe in, but there's also a lot of liberty when it comes to answering certain questions, and we may differ on that. And praise God for having differences of opinions about things. Can I get an amen? Yeah, so we're, all, we're not all called to, uh, to talk alike and dress alike. That, that's called uniformity, and the, and the Bible doesn't talk about that. Unity is coming together even with different approaches and different opinions on things. Would, would you say that's fair? So, um, first question I want to throw out, and, and feel free, anyone that wants to field this uh, question, this is, a, this is a really good one, having to do with uh, culture. Um, how do we stand up as Christians and speak up and speak out instead of being complacent and silent in regards to how corrupt and moralist the world is quickly becoming and is? That's a good question, isn't it? Nothing like starting off light with the Q&A time on Sunday morning, right? So how do, what, what is our role as, as believers in a culture that uh, is corrupt and moralless? What is our place, right? Especially when um, you see a lot of complacency and silence, especially maybe from the church. So any, anyone want to tackle that and, and give us some, some insight on that? Okay, Norm Davis. All I can say is really um, that we need to be salt and light. I think the I think the scripture is pretty clear that that we're the ones to be able to to shine and give the example of Christ, um, you know, to those around us. Um, I, I, I like um, and Scott used this not too long ago the the about how gold is refined or silver is refined. And, he can, and it's not really refined until all the dross is off the top and actually the guy who's molding whatever it is in silver or gold can see his reflection in it. That's how we need to be. Hmm. Um, I don't think we need to be overtly Christian. I think if we're Christian, that it should be overtly obvious to others who aren't hmm. just by our just by our nature, by by how God is working in our lives and, mm. and changing us, and the hope that is within us. You see, the question almost has a negative context, whereas if we approach it with a positive context, that we're salt and light, we're that we are uh, able to be able to to bring hope to those uh, who uh, see the world as degraded and degrading. Of course, I mean that's 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 how. That's how the world is. It's it's temporal. Um, what God has planned is eternal, and I mm. think if we stay focused on that, and we stay joyful. Then those who want, or who who notice those things, would want to know the, what what what's that joy that's in us. That and that, that's and the word says that that we're we're to be open and to express, you know, to someone who asks us mm. about that joy that's within us. So yeah, good. I like it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, just a quick thing to that is I think a lot of times in, in the world we see uh, the guys with other opinions as enemies rather than people. 
you know. And so Ephesians 4 says that, you know, when we do get that opportunity to speak, that we speak the truth in love. <clears throat> so mm. consider the audience. What are they going through, you know? And don't just assume that their motives are evil, you know. Assume that their motives are good, you know, and try to answer in love to speak to them. Mm. I like that. David, you want to add anything? I guess um, one other thought is just that Jesus came in a time that was moralist and corrupt, and his agenda wasn't to change the tone of the overarching culture or to overthrow Rome. His agenda was to seek and save the lost, mm. and he's given us that same calling, whether it's here in 21st century America or anywhere else, Christians are called to love and to draw others into that love that yeah. they've experienced. Yeah, it's good. We live in a corrupt and moralless world. Can, can we just accept that? Like, we assume, <laughs> right? It always has been since the fall, right? Go back to Genesis chapter 3. Um, here's an interesting thing. The name of our church, Missio Dei. Latin for, and some of you are like, this was actually a question. What does Missio Dei mean? God who is on mission. That's what the name Missio Dei means. There's a God who's on mission. And what is this God's mission? To seek and save those who are lost. And we took the name because when Jesus says to the disciples, as the Father sent me, that word sent is important. Write it down in your notes. There's, there's a lot of blank spots in your, in your program this morning. Write the word sent. Because as the Father has sent the Son, right, coming into this world, Jesus says to his disciples, now I send you. So we participate in the Missio Dei. We are God's agents now to go into the world. And as Norm said, salt and light, right, we now represent the true kingdom, the kingdom that will be the reigning kingdom for eternity that's even busted into the world right now, we are his agents to tell people about this new kingdom, this king. And so you should expect opposition. You should expect persecution. You should expect people living in sin. Why? Because they're sinners of whom we were once named among them. And now we have the opportunity to not bring the, the kingdom's coming because God is sovereign over this kingdom. We're pointing people to a greater king and kingdom. And that's our responsibility. And how do we live in a culture like that? Look at the lives of Moses and look at the lives of Daniel and look at the lives of, of anyone who lived in a context that was far from God honoring. David respected the leadership. He rose in ranks politically and used his life lived before God as an opportunity to, to tell people about this God who's sovereign over all. Read the book of Daniel. That's how you live. You don't fight against it. You, you live contrary to the values and ethics and you bring in a different ethic and, and value. And that's, the, that's, that's Jesus' ethic in kingdom. So, and you get notice. Yeah. You, it's, the kingdom doesn't come by force. The kingdom comes by grace. Amen?
So that's good. I like that. How about this question? Um, will a follower of Jesus lose their salvation if they choose to sin once in a while? I mean, certainly God wouldn't, wouldn't kick you out of the kingdom, right? If you choose like, yeah, I want to be naughty today, right? Um, knowing you're doing something you shouldn't do, but do it anyways. Is it different when you sin on accident versus on purpose? Anyone want to take that one? <laughs> I guess I shouldn't have sat in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> That's the hot seat, my friend. Um, Gosh, no. We're, the Bible says that we, if we're in Christ, we, we're positionally secure before him. We're justified. And uh, we're also um, imputed his righteousness. And so I believe in e the eternal security of a believer if we're truly in Christ. Irrespective of whether or not we're sinning willfully or sinning by accident, Although the Bible does give us warnings to check yourself, to examine yourself, you know, mm. to to see if you're still in the faith, to see if you're still walking in a pattern of obedience. And I think that ultimately has to do with our hearts, mm. our posture inwardly before the Lord, first and foremost. That shows whether or not we are we we have repented. Um, but man, there's times like yesterday, I probably ate more than I should have eaten. <laughs> That's a sin. Sinner. Right? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm doing it, and I know I'm doing it, you know, or having that extra dessert when you shouldn't, right? Um, I mean, that might be, that's one example. But there's, there's others where it's like, man, I'm, I, I, I am aware of the sin, and I'm aware that I shouldn't be doing this, and I do it anyway. I think that's human. That's part of uh, battling our flesh. And, and, uh, but that, that doesn't mean that I'm, I'm, I'm not saved. It just means that, man, I, I should keep, keep an eye out for those moments, that they, they should be decreasing. Mm. Right? There should be, a, I should be... Uh, surrendering more and more of, of my walk and my uh, behavior towards the Lord, but it's ultimately about a, an inward posture of repentance toward him. David, can I follow up real quick? I think if you, if you, you come to a place where you, maybe you're convicted, what, what, do you, what would your encouragement be to someone to not just exist in that realm of guilt and shame and condemnation? What, what would you say to somebody um, and again, this is, this is, we're freestyling up here. So I'm throwing some heavy stuff out at these guys. So what would you say, what's your encouragement? Uh, confession. Okay. Uh, we confess our sins, not only before the Lord, but to one another. And I think that's another thing that, man, we struggle with as a church nowadays is living corporately Yeah. in America, I think, especially because we're so individualistic. Yeah. I can do it myself. I can, you know, I can, I can do this religion thing in however I want to. And, and uh, I think we ask for help. I think that's part of our sanctification is saying, hey, Monty, can you pray for me, man? I'm struggling with this. I ate too much yesterday. <laughs> too much enchiladas. <laughs> Whatever it is. Is but, there such thing? Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. But, uh, but doing it corporately, asking yeah. for help, you know, like uh, praying with one another. So that, I don't know. That's, that's yeah. yeah. I think confession is uh, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. Write that down. If, if we confess our sins, we're going to find God to be faithful and righteous, to forgive us our sins. Mm. Um, if, if we pretend to have no sin and say we live in the light, we, we make God uh, ourselves out to be liars. That's what 1 John says. C come clean. God already knows, right? Come clean, lay these things out before him, and let him uh, lift that burden, right? And, and remind you that you're human and you're a work in progress, right? Yeah. Anything you guys want to add to this question? Ooh, Lori, you're you're married to a pastor, aren't you? <laughs> but like, it's almost like what David said. It's just a like, just to actually go through the activity of confession, like forgive the Lord of these things that I know I've done, and just please forgive me the things that I've I've done that I didn't know that I did. Yeah. So it doesn't matter how you pray it or how often you pray it, but just pray it, right? And then um, the, the key part of the question is like, is there a sin that I can take care of and take care of the Lord? And that's the part that's kind of hard, right? But what we can do, and what we preached on last week is looking back over the last year, we should 
I like that. Yeah. The people at home need to hear it on the recording. Oh, you're recording. <laughs> Hi, friends. I'll just kind of keep this out live like this. Okay. Thank you. Just one thing I wanted to add is that, <clears throat> you know, when you see leaders in the church or whatever that apostatize or fall away from the faith, it's usually not just one thing. It's not a hard left turn. It's usually a series of mm. small sins that lead them farther and farther from the path. And so I think, you know, we just need to be, are we okay with that? Are mm. we okay with those small sins? If we are, then we need to get, you know, on our knees before the Lord and, and have him help us to see sin from his perspective. Mm. So. I think that's wise. I think um, Lori was referring to Psalm 19. Write that down. There's the sins of commission and there's the sins of omission. And the, and the psalmist says, Lord, I confess the sins I know about. And Lord, please forgive me of the things I'm unaware of. Like that is pretty thorough. Like if you think about it, like coming before God and saying, Lord, I'm aware of things and I want to, I want to bring those into your light and I want to confess those and I want you to to purify my, my heart and my mind. But Lord, even if there's things I'm not aware of, I confess those things to you. And that is pretty powerful if you think about it. And uh, we did talk about it last week, and I appreciate what Monty just said, because Samson was one of those guys who sinned, and then nothing happened, and he thought, okay, maybe I can do it again. And he didn't have, and if you remember, the uh, bad idea bro in his life. We need friendships where someone says, bad idea, bro. And I use bro generically. It could be male or female, all right? Bad idea. Who are the people in your life saying, not a good idea, get on a different path, right? Get on God's path. Um, we, we need that. That is one of the key ingredients of being a follower of Jesus is inviting people who will journey with you, who are for you, but they're also not afraid to tell you when you get off off track. Howard. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone want to add anything to that? I'm going to, I'm going to, I'll, I'll speak to that and say, Number one, the, the heart of a person that genuinely is saved will hunger and thirst for righteousness. They're not going to want to sin, even though there's still there's going to be those temptations and enticements. Um, so one of the key indicators that I am saved is that there's a hunger for Jesus. There's a, there's a recognition when I fall short of what God wants me to do. Uh, I feel I'm scared for the person who's complacent and, and maybe apathetic and who uses grace as a license to sin. Romans chapter 6, Paul says, may we sin so that God's grace increases, may it never be. Um, God is the one over our salvation. So I want to I change the question to what's more important is those whom God has saved, is there a way we can do something to alter his plan and purposes? No. Once you're saved, you're always saved. And if someone walks away from the faith, that's indication they were never saved to begin with. Uh, Hebrews chapter 6, it, there's people who have tasted, been to church, taken communion, sang songs. Those externals are never indications of what's going on internally. That's why the writer of Hebrews, in one of the most difficult passages of the entire Bible, says it's impossible to renew them again to repentance, meaning they've experienced something externally but internally, they were never saved to begin with. Jesus says in John chapter 10, once you're in my hands and I'm in the Father's hands, there's a double security there. No one could ever, 
ever take that salvation away from you. Romans chapter 8, no one can separate you from the love of Jesus Christ, right? Uh, neither life nor death nor angels or principalities. So John 10, Hebrews 6, Romans chapter 8. Anything you would add to that? I was going to say, I grew up in um, a church, Howard, I think you did too. I don't know if you did. Where um, you could lose your salvation and you always had that fear. Um, and there, that's the key. The fear is fear, fear, which is a lot of religions, right? Exactly. Catholicism, Mormonism, nothing motivates Jehovah's people Witness, like no fear. Matter. So what <laughs> happened is I ended up walking the aisle like 15 times. Every time I felt like, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I wasn't good this week, I would walk that aisle again. And so what Scott is saying, I think, is that we um, we loosen or dumb not dumb down but we we take away the power of the cross when we think he's taken our sins once and for all he's nailed them on the cross we are saved we are doubly uh, saved right we are in the father and the father is, is in god and we are new wine skins all those beautiful verses that talk about being a new creation i think what happened is is a, a lot of those passages that talked about the seed falling on the dirt and then it heard, and then it was uh, enlightened for a moment, and then it just quickly dried up. A lot of people take those verses as salvation verses. I was once saved, but now I'm not. Another verse is... With can, I, can I say something real quick? On the four seeds and soils, the first three are not saved. Only the last one is. Only the seed that brings forth fruit is the one that is saved. So Jesus is using a picture common to the people at that time to say there's all these evidences but only the last one is the one that's truly saved right the so one that brings forth fruit. very differently than how i was raised sure. and then the other one was just the pruning of the vine and the cutting off you know John like 15. that was very much preached as you were once on the vine in christ but now you've sinned so much that you have to be cut off and thrown into hell yeah Whew. which language like that is never associated with believers which is unfortunate. You get the Jesus talking about the weeping and gnashing of teeth and the outer darkness and the cutting and the burning off. And it's like, those are never references to believers yeah. in Christ. I just don't think that we need to be walking around thinking, am I saved? Am I not? Am I saved? Am I not? What it does do though, and what I did appreciate about that upbringing is it really made my sin um, heavy and it made me... Um, not I'm probably not the right kind of fear, but it made me very um, contemplative of my own sin, uh, lest I be not in God's favor. So it did do good in the fact that it um, it it brought those things very seriously to light. Yeah. Anyone want to add anything? I'm sure there's parts we're missing. I guess to be um, to respect the original question, which is willful sinning versus like sinning without, like, I didn't do it on purpose, right? I, right. I, I can't think of any particular scripture reference that, that talks about those differences yeah. in the New Testament as it applies to a believer. Right. But um, I don't know that there should be a difference necessarily. Like, sin is sin, right? Right. Like, if I do it on purpose or if I did it on accident, it's, it's a sin. It, it, all sin is equal before the Lord, right? Yeah. I would, to add, I think this is such a huge part of what we're discussing. The Spirit comes to those who are newly, those who are saved. We have the spirit forever. We will never lose the Holy Spirit as, as new believers in Christ, right? As believers in Christ. The spirit brings a new hunger. It brings new appetites, right? It brings, it brings new desires, right? This is an inward change that God brings upon the human soul, spirit, heart, whatever word you want to use. And what David's referring to is this idea that I, I'm more aware of how I fall short of what God wants, but I'm also quick to recognize that, confess it, find the grace, right? That God says, for, for, you know, confess, you find forgiveness, move on. He's going to perfect this work in Christ Jesus till the day he comes back. That's what uh, Philippians chapter one, verse six says. And so one of the key indications that you are in Christ is that you have new appetites, you want Jesus. You don't want Jesus because you have to, you know, go to church and you have to pray, but you want to. You want to read the word. You want to, to disclose your heart to him. You, you want these things. And, and in discipleship, as we journey together, that's what we do together. It's like, how are your desires? Are they, are they for the Lord? Are they for Christ? 
Um, so I, that's what I would say as, as to that. So thank you, Howard, for bringing us back full circle to that. It's, a, it's an important question. And literally, we could probably take all morning and talk about that. So uh, we're getting a battery change right now. Give it up for the uh, AV team to recognize that. You got to celebrate small things, right? Rod. Yeah. Yeah. Resisting. Resisting. Yeah. The Bible says grieve, you grieve the Holy Spirit or quench the work of the Spirit. Which, again, think about those words. Those are relational words. If I grieve my wife or I grieve my children, like there's a dynamic, a living, active, real dynamic there that says, what do I need to do to make this better? And obviously it's not the Spirit's problem. It's, it's my problem where I'm probably embracing things that hinder versus help God's work in my life. And write down these verses, John 14, John 16, the Holy Spirit not only guides us in truth, but convicts us. And I tell you what, if you're not feeling conviction, you're not walking in step with the Spirit. That's what uh, Galatians chapter 5 talks about, right? And so I think any activity, choices, decisions that are contrary or contradictory to God's will and word will grieve or quench the Spirit. But that doesn't mean you lose your salvation. What it means is the Spirit's probably going to convict you of this and bring this in, in whatever timetable. See, we don't know if this is going to happen in two hours or two days or two weeks. Anyone realize this sometimes? Like, man, how long will that person choose to make poor decisions until God convicts their hearts? See, sometimes we don't get convicted in the same season as we're sowing the sin that we're sowing. Yeah, I would say um, that... Jonathan Edwards kind of put it uh, kind of pointedly. You're going with, top shelf now, Norm. <laughs> I like this. With with mortification of sin. Yeah. Um, we our our job basically is to kill sin and uh, you know mortify sin in the flesh. Just get rid of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and the way that we do that is staying plugged into His Word, yeah. praying, seeking Him. And 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 if you're a Christian, you're going to want that anyway. That that heart change has happened inside you. And so you're going to want to not sin. Yeah. And, and Lori mentioned earlier, and very appropriate, that, um, you know, Romans 7, talking about Paul's struggle with his own sin. And we, we struggle with that every day. Uh, mm-hmm. But it doesn't mean that we, we slough it off. Oh, man, you know, God's going to forgive me, blah, blah, blah. No, we, need, we, we really need to kill it. We need to, we need to pray about it. We need to seek God's counsel and other godly counsel. Um, mm-hmm brothers and sisters, whatever the case may be. Yeah. And, and confess it and bring it out in the open. And, and, and again, we're talking about the openness and, and the, and the transparency of the church here. We need to be open and transparent with each other. We need to be, we need to, to, to let people know what we're struggling with, the, the things that we're, that's going on in our lives. And, and when we do that, we have such a team of prayer warriors that surround you and pray with you. And there's been so much success in this church by things like this happening. So, mm. you know, please, um, you know, but again, like to, to reiterate, no, I don't think that, that you can lose your salvation because you sin. Um, we, we sin because we're sinners and that we're, but we're saved by grace and yeah. that we, we need to understand that, that we are, and that we need to mortify um, sin. We need to. We need to turn. Amen. 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 Good. Anything you want to add? No. Next question. All right. Next question. Uh, I have a whole host of questions here. What should I throw out? Yeah. Um, 
Ooh, how about this one? Um, why do good things happen to good people? And why do bad things happen to good people? Yeah, I reversed it. Why do bad things happen to good people? Why do good things happen to bad people? All right, good people on this side, bad people on this side. Let's divide the room. You ever heard this question before, right? Why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? What do you guys think? Who wants to field that one? Because we want to be like Jesus. Microphone. Microphone. Okay. Um, Well, because... uh, good what is good and what is bad right like are we talking about 9-11 we all asked that question after 9-11 like god why why did all those people die innocent people by the hands of stupidity um we all asked that question and the church grew by leaps and bounds remember those years it's like everyone wanted those answers and um why did my mom die of cancer she was the most godly woman i've ever known but in her death she glorified God. And so because of her life and in her death, she said, babe, this is, this is how I'm going. Right. And so I could see that as a bad thing. I wanted my mom, Mm -hmm. but God had a better plan in the fact that through her death, people would come to him through nine 11. People would start to ask those questions through pain and suffering uh, was it Corey Ten Boom, babe, that said it? Hmm. We'll never know that Jesus is all we need until he is all we have. And, and until we are at rock bottom, you guys, and not self-sufficient and not pull yourself up by your bootstraps or whatever that phrase is, until we get to that place of truly needing a Savior, we will never know him as hmm. Savior. And so for me and all of our years of infertility and losing a church and all those, these big, huge, painful milestones brought me closer to my Savior. And I would never change it. Hmm. Anything you guys would add? This is, this is probably one of the most, um, probably most asked question in all of human history. Because no one is immune to suffering. No one is immune to, to evil, bad things. Uh, yeah, I think Lori put it really well, but um, just we have such a limited perspective on what's going on, you know, that that God has. We I don't think God is big enough in most of our our eyes because He has, you know, He can be do, doing ten thousand things in your life, and you're probably only aware of about three of them, <laughs> right? Amen. And uh, somebody said, I can't remember who it was, but. I'm full of quotes with no sources. So just it's either C. S. Lewis, either C. S. Lewis, Benjamin Corey Franklin, Corey Ten Boom, or Jesus. One of those yeah. four. So. <laughs> so this person said, if I had God's power, omnip- omnipotence, I would probably change everything in the world. But it's a, if I also had his wisdom, I'd leave it the same. Mm. You know. So. Good. I just thought of something. I'm gonna throw this out. I want you to write this down. This is this. I think this is good. In God's eyes, there are no bad situations. But also in God's eyes, there are no good people. Would, uh, so all, all of us are sinners who fall short of God's righteousness. That's why Jesus says, why do you call me good? There's only one who's good, and that's God. So our understanding of good is way different than God's understanding of good. There are no innocent people. There are no good people. In God's eyes, we are all sinners who fall short of his glory. But also, too, if God is sovereign and orchestrating the affairs of, of daily activity of weak, sinful, fallible people, is God also wise enough to orchestrate all things to work together for good? Romans 8, 28, right? So if you think about it, there are no bad situations. Even Joseph confronting his brothers in Genesis 50, what you meant for evil, God caused for good. So what we have to think about now is that there's a greater purpose for things. And uh, we've got Corey Ten Boom. We've got anonymous quote. We've got C.S. Lewis quote. Pain is God's megaphone to rouse a deaf world. C.S. Lewis. The reason we all feel pain and suffering, it's a common denominator among every single human being is because 
when we experience something like pain, suffering, we know it's not the way things ought to be. Which now says, what should things be? And outside of Christ, you'll never find the answer to that question. Which the cross is now the greatest act of evil and suffering in all the universe. There is no more horrendous act than God sending his son, innocent, pure, spotless, blameless, sinless, to die a cruel, heinous death on a cross that he didn't deserve to die. We should have been in that place. And there's the gospel, which then doesn't necessarily answer all of our questions about his pain and suffering, but it gives us an end goal that God is going to redeem all things to work together for good, including you and my salvation, our salvation. Amen? Uh, anything you would add to I'll that? I say, if approaching someone who is suffering, I'm just trying to think, uh, if like something happened to one of our kids, if my daughter got raped, like would I, could I sit up here and be like, God means you for good? No. Like in the moment, don't it say hurts. that. It hurts. Don't say that to someone. Please, God, I don't want her to get raped. But I'm just saying as an example, you know what I'm saying? Like that's tough to hear when you're in it. So if you're coming alongside someone who is going through pain and suffering, don't throw those verses at them right away. Just be there. Be present with them. Cry with them. Scream with them. Be angry with them. Um, there will be opportunities at some point, 1 Peter 3.15, with gentleness and respect, share the hope that you have. Right? It may not be fresh off of a cancer diagnosis or someone victimized or something, but there, there should be an opportunity. You sit there and go, this person needs to hear about the hope in Christ. Amen? Amen. Right? So I, I agree. Yeah. We never wish these things are going to happen, though. Can I share a quick story? You sure can. So a friend of mine, a uh, non-believer, uh, he and his wife, his wife is a believer. His, his son was a believer. He's not a believer. He was skiing with his son, and uh, long story short, his dad said, okay. His son said, let's go home. I think he was 15 or 16 years old, and his dad said, let's do one more run. They did one more run, and his son hit a tree and died. You know, just the most horrible thing. Um, years later, I was sitting with him for the first time. I got an opportunity to, and, you know, this man just was so grateful because the church that she and her son went to surrounded them and just loved them. And he said it, he said, I, you know, I understand why God did this. God did this to bring me to Christ. Nothing else would have done it, you know. So sometimes the perspective we get afterwards the the hindsight is 2020 right mm. and, and so when you're in the middle of it you can't help you can't hope to see what god's doing but sometimes not always but sometimes afterwards god gives us some of that insight yeah i would add to that when my mom died one of the one of the toughest things i so i was 15 years old and i came to a point probably within a year after her death so probably 16 years old Perhaps God removed her so I could have a deeper walk with him. I was new in Christ at that time. And my, my brother, who's younger, my sister, all of us began this journey that it deepened our faith. And tragedy can do two things, right? It, can, it could drive you away from God or it could drive you closer to God. And I, and I thought so many times before God, you know, did you take my mom so that somehow you could bring me even closer to Christ? Could God... I'll never know the answer, but it was one of those things that I entertained that God allowed the suffering to perhaps do a greater work beyond my mom's death and with her kids. So it's tough. We never wish these things upon anybody, but praise God for the hope that we have, right? So Job, yeah. You guys have a lot of reading assignments. Read Job, read Daniel, read the word, right? Uh, maybe one or two more questions. How about this one, you guys? Um, I like this one. Um, so Proverbs 22 says, don't be a friend of one who has a bad temper. Some of you are like, okay, write that friendship off. Uh, Luke 6, 
do not judge because you too will be judged. How can someone determine if someone has a bad temper without judging someone? There's a difference between judging and a judgment. I can make a judgment that you have an anger problem. Are you looking at me right now? No. You don't okay. <laughs> I wish you had an anger problem. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. He's so not an anger problem. But a lot of people do. Like you can make a judgment, especially with believers, right? Like we are called to call each other out. Like we said that gently. But um, um, and the person who has an anger problem, they know they have an anger problem. And so what or do maybe you they don't. I don't know. Oh, no, they know. Don't you think that most people who have an anger problem know they have? I, I think they do. I think they know. Uh, but um, so that's the difference is make a judgment, but don't be judgmental. It's it's verse. It's an action versus a state of being. Um, how can how can someone determine if someone has a bad temper without judging them? How do you? So I, I, I mean, I think the problem here is that people just take the one verse, you know, Jesus said, do not judge, you know, and so you're judging me, right? Don't judge me. But, <laughs> right. So, but Jesus, if you read the whole thing, he says, he says not, he says, don't judge. You know, you get a log in your eye. How do you, how are you going to take this back out of the, your brother's eye? He says, first take the log out of your own eye, then go do it. So, you know, uh, I've heard other people say that we're not to be, we're not to judge, but we're supposed to be fruit inspectors, right? So uh, is there fruit in that person's life? Is the fruit good or bad? You know, yeah. and so it's not, do not judge. We're not making, God's not talking, or Jesus wasn't talking about a final judgment, but a, or, yeah, a final judgment. He was talking about making a, uh, uh, an observation, yeah, yeah. Uh, a measurement of the, situation that exactly that in. you know the word yeah. that monty's circling around is hypocritical that's what jesus is saying in matthew chapter word. 7 right the bible doesn't say we're not to judge oh we're to judge but we're to judge without hypocrisy we're to judge without condemnation right the the goal is restorative Whenever I think about Matthew 18 and church discipline, I think about the fact that the desire is not to further shame and guilt someone. The desire is to restore someone and say, God wants something better. And as your friend, I want to journey with you toward that better thing, right? Um, the Bible does talk about anger. It does talk about a temper, but it doesn't say you're to never be angry. It says, be angry, but do not sin in your anger, Ephesians chapter 4. Are there things we should get angry about that are righteous things? Yes. Lives of the unborn, right? Um, other, you know, injustices that go on in other countries. And we sit there and go, no, this is not good for the people, right? But there are things, let's be honest, when it comes to anger that are very selfish. This is why we get angry, if we're honest. It's because you didn't meet my expectation. And oftentimes expectations are one of two things, either unspoken or unrealistic. And every anger stems from a violation of what I want, which is not necessarily what God wants. Anger is an indication of selfishness. Think about this. That's why James says in chapter 1, be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to get angry, for the righteousness of the anger of man does not accomplish the righteousness of God. The moment I'm ready to get angry is the moment I need to step back and go, why am I getting angry? 99.9% .9 of the time, it's because there's something selfish I'm working through. Thomas Jefferson <gasps> said, if I feel angry, I'm going to count to 10. But if I'm really angry, I'm going to count to 100. Right? Anger is reactive. When in reality, it, we, it, every situation deserves not reaction, but response. Response is calculated. It is thought through. It is, it is this ability to stop and go, I need to assess. I need a reason, right? Ex when we think of anger, we think of explosive. We think of reaction, and that's not what the word speaks of. And so uh, those are just some thoughts. So uh, anything on anger, temper, you guys would want to add? All good? I mean, it's not good. <laughs> yeah. uh, and again, one of the fruit of the Spirit, kindness, kindness Patience, peace, self-control. 
it's all anger, right? <laughs> Love, joy, peace, faith. So it, it's, I think it's important. Um, and, and men generally tend to be, have more anger issues than women. And I think it, because it's really tied into identity and men who don't feel like there's success at home or success in the workplace can feel anger deeply because they, they find so much of their identity in the things that they do and want to accomplish or the lack of those things being done or accomplished and just feeling self-defeated, right? And so um, this, is, this is a huge thing. You know, there's, there's domestic violence, right, which is on the rise and, and people are feeling that during the days of COVID and political unrest and all this stuff. And boy, to be people that say, you know what, I'm going to be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to get angry. Not just men, though. It's not just men. No, I'm just saying generally, though, men really have an issue with this. So, yeah. Anything you want to add to that? Uh, I was just thinking, panel. like, anger starts young, you know, for those who've had kids, those temper tantrums where the kids just throw themselves on the floor. They're just angry. They don't know how to process their feelings. And so that's really it. It's just, and you say it's a man problem, but I think I know a lot of angry women, too, that just don't take the time to, like, well, how am I feeling? Like, why am I this way before mm -hmm. raging? I mean, I, I've raged before, yeah. once or twice. Yeah. And it's because I just don't take the time to think about, usually it's in the car. One time, Lori threw a laundry basket at me. Like in, in, in 30 years of marriage. Right? <laughs> I'm just saying. I'm it just was saying, empty. I'm going to tell you, I deserved it. <laughs> but that's how much Lori rages. She threw a laundry basket at me. I love it. Uh, last question, maybe. Last question. Um, here's an interesting one. There are seven churches mentioned in the book of Revelation. So if you, if you look at the book of Revelation, matter of fact, turn there, last book of the Bible, chapters two and three. The question is, what church do you identify with? Which is an interesting question. You guys study much on the churches of Revelation? No. Yeah, yeah, no. Uh, turn there in your Bibles, if you would. Revelation chapter one, two, three, uh, first three chapters there. Let me, let me share something real quick about Revelation as you guys are maybe organizing thoughts. Um, and I don't, I don't mean to kind of like perceive the spirit behind the question. Here's what we know about the seven churches that John writes to. And if you look in your Bible, right, there's, there's Ephesus, there's Smyrna, there's Pergamum, there's um, Thyatira, Sardis, right, Philadelphia. Um, not Pennsylvania, another Philadelphia. So um, those are literal real churches. Those are literal churches that the letter from John went to. Now we have to ask ourselves, well, why did John send a letter to these churches? He sent a letter to encourage them because they were being severely persecuted by a guy named Nero. Outside of that, we're not to take those churches and apply them in some other context that they were never meant to be applied to. Meaning, people today would say, oh, we're living during the spirit of the church of Laodicea. And I sit there and go, where does it say that? We tend to approach the book of Revelation. So here's the greater thing I want to get across. We spiritualize the book of Revelation, as if it's supposed to mean something to us today. I'm going to tell you right now, stop that. The, the book of Revelation means something for the original audience it was written to 2,000 years ago. The churches of, of Revelation mentioned were real churches dealing with real stuff. And four of the seven were called to repent of certain activity. What's good is that we realize that we deal with stuff that we're called to repent of. We talked about repentance and confession earlier. These churches were on the verge of being judged by God, but praise God because of his grace says, hey, I want you to know you're, you're doing these things and you shouldn't do them. Repent of them. Because your desire to continue to do the things that God doesn't want you to do will be heightened because of the persecution. You'll be quick to want to renounce or walk away from your faith because of the intensity coming your way. So the, this, this letter was meant to strengthen the churches. And Revelation 1 through chapter 18 were all things going on during first century, early 
church Christian history. Chapter 19 is the coming of Jesus Christ, which is the event we're all waiting for, right? Jesus, come back! Yeah! But chapter 1 through 18 are all things that already took place. We are not to hijack the book of Revelation to mean something spiritual and or futurist or figurative when it was never designed that way by God to do it. The key interpretive thing for Revelation is the Old Testament. Are you guys in the book of Revelation? Turn there, turn there real quick. I want you to write a note at the top of the, the opening page. There are 278 Old Testament allusions out of the 404 verses of the book of Revelation. 278 Old Testament references for 404 verses. What's the main interpretive key for the book of Revelation? The Old Testament. It's not... Oh, Beware of Apache helicopters produced by a government that we know as the U.S. of A. that's controlled by the whore of Babylon. It's not meant to get us to that place. It meant something for the original audience, and that's it. And what's the book of Revelation about? Worship. God separating a people unto himself that are going to be true worshipers of the Lamb, and especially worshipers of the Lamb that endure persecution. He says, continue to keep your eyes on the Lamb who ultimately is victorious, right? That's the last part of Revelation. He who comes on that white steed, the second coming, right? The, the judgment, new heavens, new earth, woo! All that stuff we're looking forward to. That's chapter 19 on. But the first 18 chapters of Revelation have to do with the immediate context of what John's writing to, these seven churches that are all dealing with some stuff. Um, not every church got uh, um, a word of, of reprimand, some of the churches got words of commendation, but four of them were called to repent because they weren't being the salt and light God had designed them to so be. So I have a really important follow-up question. It's okay. not even about revelations, but what you said a couple of minutes ago in the fact that we are not to look at the first six, like whatever chapters. First 18 chapters. It. So how do we then approach all of scripture because I can, uh, my Bible study is going through the, the Galatians. We just did Galatians. Now we're doing Corinthians. And we are applying what the letter was written to the Corinthians. We're applying it to our own lives today. Sure, sure. So how do we, because I don't want you to contradict yourself. You wouldn't say that we're not to read, let's say, Job, which was for Job, and not interpret or take an application right. for that. So how do we dissect what was meant for Israel or what was meant for a particular group? And then what is meant for us? Great question. So two things. One is all scripture is written for us, but not necessarily to us. Okay. Scripture is scripture and it was written by a certain author to a certain audience during a certain, some sort of context, right? It's written for this reason. So all scripture is given to us, but it's not necessarily all written to to us. It's written for us. We can learn, second principle, timeless theological principles. Write that phrase down. That's important. Because what, what churches of Revelation do I identify with? All of them. Let's be honest. Are there times I feel adulterous in my heart? Yes. Are there times I feel lukewarm in my heart? Yes. So what church? Ask me what day. Wouldn't it be funny if we went around and said, how are you doing today, Thyatira? That, that's how I'm feeling today. What are you doing today? Oh, Ephesus. I'm feeling a little Ephesus. I'm re I've, retur I've lost my first love, right? Like, let's just be honest. The churches 2,000 years ago struggle with the same thing churches today struggle with. And the call, and here's the grace of God. John writes to these churches and says, wake up. There's something to live for, Right? He says to us today through his scripture, church, wake up. There's something greater to live for, right? So um, there are timeless theological principles we can draw out, out of all of scripture. Don't we go then to another, find, try to find another form to look for oh, scripture? Yeah, S scripture I mean. interprets scripture, yes. which is a great rule. Let me, let me, case in point, Revelation chapter 3.20. Look at, look at Revelation 3.20. We've all heard this verse before. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Whoever shall open his door to me, I shall come in and, and sup with him, right? Sup. That means we're going we're gonna to have a meal together, right? Sup. Here's the thing. How many of us have heard that in an evangelistic outreach context? 
That's, that's not an evangelism verse. That's a, that's a verse that says, here's a church that has grown dead to the love of Christ. And Christ is like, how long have I been waiting for you to invite me back to your table? Right? What does that say to me? Does that say, I need to be more attentive in my hearing, in my seeing of what Christ is doing? Because perhaps he's outside the door of my heart knocking, and I've ignored his knock for way too long. See, it's not an, it's not an invitation to salvation. It's an enhancement of salvation you already have. And all God's people said, anything you guys would add to that? I, I was just going to add one thing to what you asked there. Are there types of scripture passages that are written to us? Yeah, one of them you mentioned before in the last question was, in your anger, do not sin. That's very descriptive and didactic, they call that. The teaching passage, that, that's written to us. Yeah. But yeah. historical passages or narrative passages, we need to be careful to take those like, as a narration. I want women to be silent in the church. That one is my favorite. That's <laughs> <laughs> Lori's weird, isn't she? No, no I mean, I, again, I grew up in a church where it's like, you can't talk. You be quiet. Well, here's the thing. That the past, when you, ha when you find something only mentioned one time in the Bible, we should not build a theology around it. Like the passage Lori just referred to, let the women remain silent. It's only mentioned one time. And the context is that it was a church where there was a group of women bringing disunity, not unity, to the fellowship. Paul says, you need to address this with these women. Jesus doesn't say, hey, make this a template application for all churches where no woman is to ever speak. Like that is wrong. We are never to build theology off of one reference to something. When Paul was healing people by his sweat rags, he would work as a tent maker, and God allowed those sweat rags, those sweat bands to be used to heal people. That's not now a principle I'm to take and say, every moment I sweat, capture it in some cloth, and now let's go out and heal people lame. But yet, televangelists capitalize on this kind of stuff, and you sit there and go, when it's mentioned once, it's what, sorry, big word, Hapax legomenon. What? Hapax legomenon. It says when something is mentioned once in the Bible, right? It's only. Speaking in tongues. No, 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 no. Well, I might be. I know. Is there someone here to interpret? So yes. the, the principle of Hapax legomenon is this. When something is mentioned one time, it's an isolated event and you're not to build a theology around it. Right? We talked about the transfiguration, which there is some theology involved. We talked, someone meant, uh, issued a question about Paul going to the third heavens in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Those are all important references, but we should be careful to make too much of it. Don't make too much of it, right? And so let scripture interpret scripture. When something's mentioned once, it's an isolated reference. But let the, when something is repeated throughout scripture, like prayer or giving or worship, those are the things we're to we're to pay attention to. So, uh, any closing thoughts? No. Norm, David, Monty. Okay. Has this been good? Has this been helpful? I mean, this is just, this is organic as organic gets right here. So, uh, appreciate you guys. Let's stand. David, I'm going to have you close in, in prayer. Cool. And thank you to the panel. Thank you guys for, and just so you know, second service, whole different set of questions. So, Ooh, <laughs> yeah. Stick around if you guys want. So, Let's, and pray. Let's, let's pray, guys. Heavenly Father, we're grateful, Lord, for your love for us. Lord, thank you for our church a family, Lord, for bringing us together. Uh, thank you for a reason to be united, Lord, um, and that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. You came to seek and save the lost. Lord, thank you for questions. Thank you for answers that we have in Scripture, and then for the questions that we don't have answers to. Mm. Lord, thank you for uh, just the grace uh, of of uh, knowing that you love us and that you're a good God and that um, there are some questions we may never have answers to, mm -hmm. but we, we have the gift of yourself and um, we have the gift of one another to help us in our walk as we journey together, Lord. I pray that you would um, help us just to love you, to honor you, to worship you, and uh, to love those that you've placed in our lives. Help us to do that even this afternoon, this evening, mm -hmm. as we go our separate ways. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. See you guys soon, all right? <laughs>